Uh, sometimes I'm asked, as, as parents are, uh, what does my son want to do for a job when he, he grows up? He, he has grown up. Um, he can't grow much further up. And uh, then they say, does he want to be a preacher like his dad? To which there's a resounding no uh, from him. Mind you, I once would have said something similar. We'll see. Uh, but it may surprise you that often you say that to ministers' children. Do you want to be a minister like your dad? And they look horrified at the idea. And, uh, but the surprise when we come to God's word is that God's only beloved son came as a preacher. Verse 14, uh, second half of verse 14, it says, He came proclaiming the gospel of God. And uh, last week we looked at uh, Jesus as the king. What kind of king? Well, in a number of ways, but he comes as a preaching king. And that's striking, isn't it? Because particularly in our culture, but I think more broadly, preaching has a negative view. Um, if you don't think that, um, depending on the dictionary you have, my dictionary says um, that defines preaching as giving obstru uh, obstrusive advice. That's what I'm doing to you now. It's giving you obstrusive advice. Uh, if you look to a thesaurus, alternative words for preaching, harangue, lecture, or moralize. Not positive words about preaching. It may come as a surprise too, because we also look that Jesus is not just king, but he's also God's rescue. So I mentioned this before confession, that I'd love to have the opportunity to burst into a room and say, come with me if you want to live. So imagine for a moment, uh, you know, watching a Marvel action film, something like that, and the hero bursts through the brick wall as they do. And before they say, come with me if you want to live, to say, but first, I've got three points. They begin with P. If you'd like to turn to Mark 1, it's not going to sell, is it, particularly? It's also a surprise he comes as a preacher because of the way Mark starts his gospel. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, um, he starts with the Old Testament prophets and uh, he, he draws from that, particularly Isaiah, how you had these major earthworks because God, the universe's king, is coming to earth. Now, what's that going to involve? It's going to be a cosmic, literary event. The God of heaven comes to earth, mountains flattens and uh, valleys raised, this huge earthworks project, project, and you get a sermon, you get a preacher. Now, we'll look at that surprise in, in a second, and, and then we'll look at another surprise, which is he still does that today. Jesus still preaches today, but through the people that he sends. Now, so far, as we've gone through Mark, and we'll see a bit more as we go on, is we've seen Jesus' identity proclaimed, the Son of God, his authority. We've seen that by Mark himself. Uh, Mark then shows us from the Old Testament, from John the Baptist, and from God. Now, we hear it from Jesus himself. So just two points, not even three points, just two points I want us to think about. The king preaches, and the king sends. So firstly, the king preaches in verses 14 to 17. Sorry, 14 to 15. So notice here, um, this is sort of the backdrop to his preaching is when he preaches. Um, so we think about when, what, and what to do with this. So the when is verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. So when, it's when John the Baptist was arrested. So when John the Baptist was arrested, there's a danger. It shows the danger for the preacher. And we saw, didn't we, that John the Baptist was very popular. Even with his popularity, he's arrested. And this comes straight after, I know I've done this before, comes straight after 14, comes straight after 13. Um, verse 13, we saw is Jesus' battle with Satan. So there's a hint that this is part of that battle. This is a, a satanic thing happening. And so if the forerunner is arrested, what's going to happen to the one he's introducing? What's going to happen to Jesus? Well, given half the chance, they will, they will kill him. What will happen to the followers of Jesus, those who come after? And it's, it's telling us something about this ongoing battle with Satan. That the spirit, we thought about this the other week, the, the spirit-filled following of Jesus is not for the faint-hearted. Um, back in the autumn, 
uh, Ben and I were in Oxford for a couple of events on the same day. And uh, before we went and had a, a bite to eat, and there was a street preacher. And I think he was going to extraordinary lengths to make sure that he was arrested. Uh, he was mentioning every hot topic button that you could press that we're told not to say in public. And, and then just and then clarifying to make sure we understood that he was saying exactly that. And as I was watching him, um, Ben and I were watching with, with great sort of morbid curiosity. And um, we thought, one thing we noticed is how everyone was ignoring him, which was interesting because there'd been protests in Oxford a day or two before. And the other thing we thought was, you don't have to try to get arrested. Um, now, not everyone who speaks the awkward parts of God's truth and the awkward parts change from decade to decade, don't they? But um, it's not always the case that God's people and his preachers are arrested and get a hard time. But it is the case sometimes. And as we go on through Mark, what Mark will make clear to us is there is a cost in following Jesus. So that's the way the backdrop of when this happens. That's sort of important. But what is this message? What is it that he preaches? Start of um, verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus makes a two-point sermon and they're related points. So verse uh, 15 is um, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. So the time is fulfilled means uh, what we've already thought about. The Old Testament, John the Baptist, they, there's these events that have happened, preparing his way, the, the messages come out, and now they look, and those people look forward to Jesus, and Jesus saying, that is the time. We've been looking forward to this moment, the moment has now come. The preparation is done, it's fulfilled. But how has the time come? Well, that's the second point. The kingdom of God is at hand. So there's the Old Testament story um, about a kingdom with a king that God rules, and some expected what would happen is this uh, king, the Christ, would come and he would free them, free the people and free the land from the Romans. So the kingdom at hand means it's because Jesus is saying, I'm here, the king is here. The kingdom isn't the land. We think of the United Kingdom as a geographical and political area. When we say the ki this kingdom, it's where is Jesus king? If Jesus is your king, you are in the kingdom. Now think about what he's saying here and imagine me doing a similar sermon. Imagine me saying, now, here is the main point of the sermon. Anyone taking notes? This is the main point, me. I am the main point of my sermon. You would probably look at ways of getting rid of me and rightly so. Nobody would do that directly. Other religions... The leaders, the founders say something like, remember my teaching, but not me. Jesus says the central point is me. And let me state something really obvious that you know, but to make it really clear. Um, the central thing about Christianity is Christ. It's Christianity. That Jesus is the center of everything. And you might think, duh, to that. But it means that it's not about me. Or about you. We live in a culture, people call it things like a, you know, therapeutic individualism. Sermons should focus on Jesus and not on me. Now to me, and to you, obviously, and we'll come to this in a moment actually, is there is a point about how we relate to living for Jesus. But he is the centre of it. And notice how he brings the kingdom is preaching it, announcing it. We thought about this. The gospel uh, means announcing good news. Uh, I, I, there's some words I never, I'd never come across until I was in a Presbyterian church. But uh, the ordinary means of grace. They are ordinary. This is where we, not that God can, use, God can use other ways, but there's these ordinary ways he's ordained, but they have extraordinary power. And that's the case of preaching because Jesus is involved by the Spirit it's a supernatural activity. So there's this two-point sermon, and then a two-point application. It might have already come up. It has um, a two-point application. 
End of verse 15. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe. Now the word um, that's translated in our Bibles, repent, means, the word literally means, changing your mind. And it's often used to change direction. I'm going this way. I forgot what I'm doing. I'm going this way. I've repented. I've gone the other way. So Jesus is saying, you need to do that, to change your mind and go the other way. And believe means, it can mean like believe something you understand to be true. It also means to, to trust something, that it, that, it, that it works. So the whole Bible, I'm going to make a bold assertion now, the whole Bible only has two points. Any Bible message, and so hopefully any sermon, only has one or both of these points. Jesus is Lord and King, and Jesus saves, rescues. So any Bible passage or sermon will have one or both of those applications, repent and believe. Repent because Jesus is Lord. He is King of all things, not you or me, and so we need to change our mind and direction to line up with him. That happens when you become a Christian. When you become a Christian, that means you've dethroned yourself and put Jesus there, There's a regime change in your life and in your mind. And then the Christian life is an ongoing repentance of keep on doing that. um, I think it's C.S. Lewis talked about it as a, um, like you move into a house and you you decorate it. What happens for most of us when we move into a house is um, there's one room that just makes you annoyed just just thinking about it. And so you, you focus on decorating that room. And then once you've decorated that room, set your lounge, you then get, well, the hall's a bit shabby. And so you do that. And then gradually you work your way through the house. Once you've done that, the first room doesn't look so good now, does it? And so he's saying, um, C.S. Lewis said, that's what the Holy Spirit does coming into our life, is there are areas of our life, and right, this bit needs sorting out now, and then gradually works our way around. Of course, we never finish that work this side of heaven. We always need redoing. So repentance is an ongoing work that we never quite finish until we're in glory. But what repentance then is for the Christian is it's ongoing recognition. Jesus is Lord and I'm not. And believe because Jesus saves. And so we need to believe in the sense of trust that he's, trust him, that his rescue mission works, that he lived, died and rose for you. So when he says, which is sort of a summary of the gospel, When he says, come with me if you want to live, you take his hand and you go. Again, that happens when you become a Christian and you keep doing it. Now, legitimate question you should be asking by now is, as you look at your Bible, if it only has two points with two applications, how did they get all this from it? Why is it so long? And then, why do you take a few verses and take even longer to preach on it? And the answer is, is that there's a lot to repenting and believing. We live in a complicated world. We live in, have complicated lives, mostly made complicated by ourselves. And so it involves unpacking in God's word and then applying to us. So every situation that you find yourself in, and I think, suppose this is what maturing is, is you, you, as a Christian you think, well, it doesn't speak about everything. We find something new. So every situation, work, home, health, leisure, you name it, God has some sorts of opinion about it. Not all equally weighted. And sometimes you come across an issue that's not in the Bible. Um, Some of these are are very new ideas. Uh, Some things we haven't even considered until recent decades. So take an issue with technology. Um, What does the Bible say about AI? We'll try to explain that to to Mark. Um, He just wouldn't know what you were talking about. Or some cultural trends would just seem weird to us even 30 years ago. But when we think about the issues around them, the Bible does speak about them. It speaks into all situations. Jesus is Lord over all things, but we need to see how. We need to change our mind and line up with Jesus about everything. Now, it's not always that, I gave an example of AI, it's not saying this is good or this is bad, but the Bible gives us wisdom as well about how we relate to these things and think through these things. So a question, very awkward question someone asked me years ago. When was the last time you read the Bible and you changed your mind? Now, particularly if you've been a Christian for a while, I wouldn't expect that to be a daily event. But it makes, it's a challenge, isn't it? We need to allow the Bible 
to make us feel uncomfortable, to challenge us, to, um, and to show us our need for repentance that is deep and varied. So we never run out of material. In fact, I, I was thinking about this as I just looked over my notes. If I came to, in 10 years, 15 years' time, to preach on this passage, I would st- and you're still the same people in front of me, I could still do it. Partly you'd all forgotten. You'd all forget by, by lunchtime, wouldn't you? But um, partly I'd see something new. But also we will live in a different world, we're in different stages. It will still, the same words, the same truths are still prompting us. It's always relevant. And so repent and believe. Many ways and aspects, and it runs quite deep. It's simple. It's very simple. So if ever you read a bit of the Bible and you go, I'm not sure what this means, I'll give you the answer. Jesus is Lord. Jesus saves. So repent and believe. Very, very simple, but deep. And so Christians actually have to think more about life rather than less. I heard a bit of Dawkins the other day, and he said, yeah, so you don't have to think about stuff. And I was thinking, you're crazy. There's stuff I think about that I'd never bother if I didn't believe these things. Now, how, how do I repent and believe in this situation? What would it look like for me? Um, John Stott, speaking about this issue, um, said that the preacher should have uh, the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. I fished this out of last week's newspaper. Um, Preachers should be more up to date. Um, so you should have these two things in the hand, the Bible and the newspaper, to make sure the Bible is, is, is addressing the issues that we're facing. And when we look at our world, we read it through the lens of God's word. So we see the world through how he sees, wants us to see it, rather than how we're told uh, to see it. So this is about deep repentance and belief. Observation I heard this week. Interesting, the same the second hymn, the writer of the second hymn, made an observation that shallow Christianity does more harm than none. That's for another time. So it's a simple message, but it's uncomfortable and it's deep. Repent and believe. Repent because you need to change something. There's something wrong. There always will be, this side of glory. And believe. You need someone beyond yourself. So an evangelistic sermon is, uh, is preaching to non-Christians, has those two points, repent and believe. But for us, it never actually moves on. Every sermon is just repent and believe. Jesus here proclaims who he is and asks us to repent and believe because he has authority. Now the rest of chapter 1 is about his, this authority. The authority has a son of God. But I'm going to focus on just the next few verses, just one where he does that, which relates to this point about preaching. So the king sends in verses 16 to 20. So here we see Jesus' authority as the son of God over people. We'll see his authority as the son of God in other areas, but here just over people. And specifically his authority is seen as he speaks. His authority speaks. Um, seen in his words, as he calls, he commissions, and he gives them a job. Now, there's two pairs that he calls, Simon and Andrew, and um, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee. In both cases, he says, follow me. And uh, both cases, he um, he says, immediately. We we looked at that word in Mark, and uh, someone through and he really does this that Mark keeps on saying immediately tells you immediately immediately he just moves the story along so in both cases he says follow me and immediately they do and it shows Jesus authority over people he calls they come try it uh, there's a lot of people in the foyer about to go to a games event to just walk up to them and say come follow me and watch their faces um, it'd be a way of growing the church, wouldn't it? To just walk into the high street and, and get everyone's attention. I'd feel very awkward even, even if it worked. And say, come, follow me. People would just look at you like, I've not seen that before. They'd just think you're, and they'd be right as well. Uh, you'd be weird. Um, but that's what Jesus does. And it works because he has authority over people. And so there's a sort of twin focus here. The focus on Simon and Andrew is they're called, the focus there is, it's true of both, but Focuses on what they're called to. 
on a purpose. And the focus on jo James and John is what they're called from. They have to leave something. Now, from Luke's Gospel, we know that Andrew is a disciple of John the Baptist. And so it's possible, even likely, that he heard about Jesus and even heard Jesus, that he heard Jesus speak. And most of our experience here, unless you're brought up in a Christian home, then even so, um, it's probably still true. But for most of us, it's a slow process of coming to Jesus. But what we see here is when Jesus calls someone with purpose, his call is irresistible and effective. So let's look at those two calls. So uh, Simon and Andrew, this purpose in verse 17, Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men which some of you hopefully now talk to kids about. Um, they were fishermen. That is their job is to cast nets into the water and pull out whatever fish they can. And Jesus repurposes them and says, now you are fishers of men. Their job is to catch people. So notice the order of events. Mark um, has set up the gospel as a battle with Satan. And here he now walks along the sea, which is a bit of an exaggeration. It's a lake. Luke calls it a lake. Mark calls it a sea. And in the Old Testament, the sea often symbolizes chaos and spiritual darkness. And so Simon and Andrew are in a battle with Satan to, to call out the lost out of this chaos, out of this sea, away from Satan's domain and to rescue them. So Jesus' battle with Satan is by preaching and then to send out more troops to preach. Not everyone here is going to be a preacher or should be, but the role of the church is to proclaim the gospel. And what we do should line up to that end. It is a team effort. We have different roles, different supporting functions, but it's to get the word to us, to be nurtured with it, and to get it out to those who need it. Now, of course, there's an element that everyone should be ready. Um, there's informal opportunities that we stumble across, and so Peter tells us to, uh, to be ready. Um, Jesus, in, in Matthew's Gospel, says the Holy Spirit is with us. We're not alone when we're dropped in those situations. Even if you're not given something to stand on and to give your three points beginning with P, we do get opportunities to speak. And so Jesus calls and gives his followers a purpose um, to communicate that good news to others. And that's how people are caught. And then James and John are called to leave something. Verse 20, and immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Both leave their day job and follow Jesus. Now, I'm not calling you to do that directly. Um, not, to follow Jesus does not mean leave your job or your study or whatever uh, you're engaged in. The rest of the New Testament makes that clear. There's plenty about how we, we work and study and uh, do our family life through the lens of the gospel. And of course it will mean some will do that, will go into mission or ministry as a sort of full-time thing. But one way or another, actually, you are a missionary. I don't live in your house or road or work in your company. But having given the caveats that Cause a sermon. Having given those caveats, let's not minimize the visual impact there. James and John are there with their dad and the hired men working. It looks like they work hard, but they have some comfort and security. They work for their dad, they can afford staff, life's as much as it can be in the first century predictable. Now, remember last week again, the Holy Spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness and into danger, and to preach. And Mark repeatedly shows that we follow in kind. Following Jesus is not the comfortable, safe option, although it leads to ultimate comfort. It will mean at times leaving the old ways. There may be things that drag you into having a... a a deeper fellowship with Jesus. It might be sin. It might be other things that in and of themselves aren't bad, but somehow keep you from Jesus. It may mean 
sacrifice, a, a comfort of some sort to serve his people or someone. There's always some leaving. There's always some cost. And it strikes me that I'm like this, and I, I think I see this in others, which is always a tricky thing to do, but we are willing to sacrifice. Most people are willing to sacrifice but the things they choose to sacrifice. And that's not really sacrifice. There's always a sacrifice. There's always an awkwardness when it comes to talking about the gospel. Uh, Rico Tice, the Christianity Explored guy, he, he talking talk about sharing the gospel. He said at some point there's a pain barrier. You need to cross. It can't be avoided. There's not an awkward free way of at some point bringing the gospel up. There's that awkward moment where one way or another we introduce Jesus to the conversation. Now what are we to expect? Well, you can think of your own experiences, but what would we expect from the New Testament? Often Christians are rejected. You, so you invite somebody to church or you speak about your faith in Christ and you get a polite no. Or occasionally, and I think it is only occasionally, you get an impolite no. But also, what do we see here? Although there is a cost, there's something to do. There's something to leave. As we proclaim Jesus, people meet him. Sometimes, through us, they hear his irresistible voice. His words are spoken today, or as they're spoken about, sometimes over time, sometimes, to use Mark's favourite word, immediately people follow him because of the, the supernatural work of Jesus through his Holy Spirit as the gospel is spoken. The kingdom is near. Repent, believe, and follow. Let's pray.